Ronya the Robber's Daughter, Chapter 11 Ronya tried to sing the wolf song for Burke as soon as they were lying on their fir branch beds. But when she remembered how Lovis had sung it for her and Matt, when everything was still as it used to be in Matt's fort, she felt such a tug of yearning in her heart that she could not go on. And Burke was already falling asleep. All day while he waited for her, he had worked to clean up the cave after the bear, which had recently finished its winter sleep there. Then he had dragged up from the woods kindling for fire and branches to sleep on. He had had a strenuous day and was soon asleep. Rania lay awake. It was dark in the cave and cold, but she was not freezing. Burke had lent her a goatskin to spread over the fir branches, and she had brought her squirrel skin coverlet with her from her bed at home. It was soft and warm to wrap herself in. There was no need for her to lie awake because of the cold, but still sleep would not come. For a long time she lay there, not feeling as happy as she wished. But through the cave opening, she could see the light, cool sky of spring, and she could hear the river rushing deep down in its gully, and that helped. It's the same sky over Matt's fort, she thought, and the same river rushing by that I can hear at home. And then she slept. Both of them woke up when the sun rose over the ridge on the other side of the river. Flaming red, it appeared from the morning mist and flared like a torch over the forest near and far. I'm blue with cold, said Burke, but dawn is the coldest hour. Then it gets warmer bit by bit. Isn't it a comfort to know that? A fire would just be still more comfort, said Branya, whose teeth were chattering too. Burke poked life into the embers and they sat beside their fire, eating their bread and drinking what was left of the goat's milk that Rania had brought. When the last mouthful was gone, Rania said, From now on, we'll be drinking spring water and nothing else. It won't make us fat, said Burke, but we won't die of it either. They looked at each other and laughed. Their life in the bear's cave would be hard, they knew, but it did not affect their spirits. Rania did not even, re even remember that she had been unhappy in the night. Now they were well fed and warm. The morning was bright and they were as free as birds. It was as if they had not realized it until this moment. Everything that had been so heavy and hard in recent days was now behind them. They were going to forget it. They never wanted to think of it again. Rania, said Burke, do you realize that we are free? He threw back his head and he roared with laughter at the very thought. Yes, and this is our kingdom, said Rania. No one can take it from us or drive us out. They went on sitting by their fire as the sun rose. The river rushed below them and all around them the whole forest had awakened. The treetops stirred quietly in the morning breeze. The cuckoos called. A woodpecker hammered at a tree trunk somewhere nearby. And on the other side of the river, an elk family appeared at the edge of the woods. And the two of them sat there, feeling as if they ruled over everything, river and wood and all the living things in them. Cover your ears! My spring yell is coming, said Rania, and she gave a yell that echoed among the mountains. There's one thing I hope more than anything else, said Burke, to be able to fetch my crossbow before you bring the wild harpies down on us with your yelling. Fetch? Where from? Rania asked. From Borka's keep? No, in the woods outside it, said Burke. I couldn't bring everything with me at once, so I made myself a hiding place in a hollow tree, and I've got all kinds of bits and pieces there that I want to bring here. Matt didn't want me to have a crossbow yet, said Rania, but I can cut myself an ordinary bow, 
If I can borrow your knife. Yes, if you take care of it. It's the most precious thing we have. Remember that. Without a knife, we can't manage in the woods. There are other things we can't manage without, said Rania. Buckets to carry water in. Have you thought of that? Burke laughed. I certainly have thought, but thoughts carry no water. That's why it's a good thing that I know where to get one, said Rania. Where? In Lovis's healing spring, in the woods below the wolf's neck. She sent Bumper there yesterday for the healing water that Noddle Pete had to take for his stomach. But Bumper got a pair of wild harpies after him and came home without the buckets. He'll have to get them today. Lovis will see to that, believe me. But if I hurry, I may get there before him. And they both hurried off. They ran light-footed all the long way across the woods and got the things they needed. It was some time before they were back at the cave, Rania with the buckets and Burke with his crossbow and other things from his hiding place. He lined them all up on the slab outside the cave to show Rania what he had. An axe, a whetstone, a small cooking pot, fishing gear, snares for catching birds, arrows for his crossbow, a short spear, all necessary things for people who are going to live in the woods. Yes, I see you know what we woodsmen have to do, said Rania. Get our own food and defend ourselves against harpies and beasts of prey. I know that well enough, said Burke. Of course we will, he got no further, for Rania had grabbed at his arm and was whispering fearfully, quiet. There's someone inside the cave. They held their breath and listened. Yes, there was someone in their cave. Someone who had taken care to steal in while they were away. Burke picked up his spear and they stood waiting in silence. They could hear someone moving around inside and it was uncanny not knowing who was there. In fact, there seemed to be more than one Perhaps the whole cave was full of harpies, lying in wait, ready to come rushing out at any moment and dig their claws into them. Finally, they could not bear to listen and wait any longer. Come out, harpies, shouted Burke, if you want to meet the sharpest spear in these woods. But no one came out. Instead, they heard an angry hissing from inside the cave. People here in Grey Dwarf's wood, Grey Dwarf's all, bite and strike. That made Rania blaze with anger. Out with you, Grey Dwarf's, she shouted. Be off with you at once. Otherwise, I'll come and pull your hair out. And out of the woods swarmed the Grey Dwarf's, hissing and spitting at Rania. But she spat back at them, and Burke showed them his spear. At that, they were in a hurry to get down the mountainside. They crawled and clambered down the steep cliff, trying to reach the river. Some of them lost their grip and fell, squealing with rage, into the waterfalls, so that the whole clumps of gray dwarfs went sailing down the river. But they managed to struggle ashore at last. They are good swimmers, those little beasts, Rania said. And good bread eaters, too, said Burke, when they went into the cave and saw that the gray dwarfs had eaten a whole loaf from their stores. They had had no time to do worse, but the fact that they had been there was enough. This is not at all good, said Rania. The whole forest will be hissing and spitting with their chatter, and soon every last harpy will know where we are. But you were not allowed to be afraid in Matt's forest. Rania had been hearing that since she was small. And it was stupid to live in dread of something that had not happened. Both she and Burke thought, so they calmly arranged their food supplies and weapons and tools in the cave. Then they got water from a spring in the forest and laid a net in the river to catch fish. They dragged home flat stones from the river's edge and made themselves a hearth on their platform. 
and they searched far and wide to find Juniper Wood for Rania's bow. As they walked, they saw the wild horses grazing in the usual glade and tried to approach Villain and Savage, speaking gently to them, but with no result. Neither Villain nor Savage understood kindness. They made off, running lightly, to graze somewhere else where they could be left in peace. For the rest of the day, Rania sat outside the cave, cutting her bow and two arrows for it. She gave up a length of her leather rope as a bowstring. Then she practiced shooting, long and happily, until at last she had lost both her arrows. She hunted for them until dusk began to fall, and she had to give up. But it did not bother her much. I'll cut some new ones tomorrow. And you take care of the knife, said Burke. Yes, I know, it's the most precious thing we have, the knife and the axe. Suddenly they noticed that it was already night and that they were hungry. The day had flown past and they had been busy all the time. They had walked and run and carried and dragged and gotten things organized and had no time to feel hungry. But now they treated themselves to a feast of bread and sheep's cheese and mutton and washed it down with clear spring water, just as Rania had predicted. The night was never dark at this time of year, but their tired bodies could feel that the day was over and that they wanted to sleep. In the darkness of the cave, Rania sang the wolf's song for Burke, and this time it went better. All the same, it made her sad again, and she asked Burke, do you think that they're thinking about us in Matt's fort? Our parents, I mean. It would be odd if they didn't. Rania swallowed before she could speak again. Will they be sorry, do you think? Burke thought a bit. It will be different. Undus will be sorry, but she'll be even more angry. I think Borka will be angry too, but more sad at the same time. Levis will be sorry, I know that, said Rania. What about Matt? asked Burke. Rania was silent for a long time. Then she said, I should think he's quite pleased that I've gone so that he can forget me. And she tried to believe it, but in her heart, she knew that it was not true. That night, she dreamed that Matt was sitting alone in the middle of a dark black wood, crying until there was a pool at his feet. And deep down in the pool, she herself sat, small again, playing with pine cones and pebbles he had given her.